You'll find treasures more valuable than gold. Digging in the Word. Hi, this is Link Hudson, and welcome to Digging in the Word. Um, thank you for joining me for the episode about why some pastors fear prophecy. I have to apologize for the rest of the video. I recorded it with uh, some free new software I downloaded, and it turned out there's a glitch with it, and it cut off the left-hand side of the screen, even though it looked like it was recording the entire screen. So if you'd like to pop up a window to watch the remainder of this video, uh, feel free to do so, or you can watch the video and see the top of my head and read uh, parts of the verses are, are on the screen. You'll, you'll miss the left-hand edge of the verse. Uh, I hope you enjoy the video teaching series. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Digging in the Word. Today we're going to talk about why some pastors are afraid of the gift of prophecy and the ministry of the prophet and um, actually some of the other gifts of the Spirit in the body of Christ. So uh, we're going to, I'm using a little bit different format where I'm going to be able to post some verses. So I hope you enjoy the uh, a little bit more uh, hopefully creative approach to uh, making a video. The first reason I'd like to talk about today is a lack of understanding. A lack of understanding um, what the uh, Bible says about church meetings, and that's one reason why some church leaders are afraid of the gift of prophecy. So in order to illustrate what I'm talking about, let's dig into the scriptures and take a look at some verses. Okay, so we're taking a look at 1 Corinthians 14. This is the most extensive passage that we have in the Bible that tells us what to do in church meetings. And if you look here... Uh, Paul's talking about um, if the church comes together and if everybody prophesies contrasted with uh, everyone speaking in tongues. So look at verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy and there come in one that uh, believes not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus the secrets of his heart are made manifest, and falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Okay, now notice this, Paul says, if you come to church and all prophesy that uh, the unbeliever or unlearned person does this, he admits that God is truly among you, all right, or that God is in you of a truth. Now, Notice Paul's positive use of everybody prophesying as opposed to uh, everyone say speaking in tongues. If everyone speaks in tongues, you're mad. But if all prophesy, this is Paul's fairly positive about this. About I mean, he has a positive attitude about everybody prophesying in church. So um, that's that's different from a lot of modern concepts about what church should be like. Uh, how many churches do you go to where you have a concept where they have a concept that everybody should prophesy? Rather, usually the emphasis is on one person preaching a sermon. You know, I, I, I did a study on this several years ago, and I tried to find examples in the Bible of a pastor going to church and preaching a sermon, and I couldn't find it. The close I could find is where Paul has a di uh, dialogue all night, the word Greek word from which we get dialogue, all night. Uh, with a group of people in Troas, uh, recorded in Acts 20. Uh, of course, Paul was not the pastor of that church in the modern sense, and actually the modern pastor doesn't really show up in the Bible as far as his uh, duties and responsibilities and some of the cultural concepts related to pastors. The apostles appointed elders, and elders had to live up to certain uh, lifestyle requirements, and uh, the, the concept is a bit different from what we see in a lot of churches where, you know, you graduate Bible school and get an or ordination papers and you can be a pastor. And a lot of churches uh, separate the concept of pastor and elder and, and uh, without requiring the pastors live up to their requirements for elders. So, um, yeah, we, we're looking at a little bit different concept from what we see in the Bible. Now, let's um, take a look further in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. I also wanted to point out that I couldn't, you know, I uh, reiterate that I cannot find any examples that say, go to church, sing three songs, listen to one guy named the pastor talk. 1 Corinthians 14 is the most extensive passage we have on what to do in church. That and uh, 1 Corinthians 11, which talks about the Lord's Supper. Okay, so let's take a look in 1 Corinthians 14 and verses 26 through 27 here. 
Um, here Paul is talking about what they do in church. He says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Notice Paul's instruction is, uh, the last sentence is not, What are you guys doing? Sit down, shut up, and let the preacher talk. Rather, his instruction is that all of these things, let all things be done. Okay, all of these things are to be done, but unto edifying. The problem is they had been doing things in a in a way that was not maximal for edification. For example, someone speaking in tongues, no interpretation, and no one else in the church is edified. So Paul's okay with all of these things being done in the church. It's good, but they have to be done in an edifying manner. So let's uh, take a look at verse 27 and verse uh, 28 here. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Um, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Um, I know a, uh, a Greek scholar who would say that if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three, he would say that uh, two or at the most three refers to the uh, tongues spoken or the utterances in tongues because one, the word man here in Greek is one, um, one person cannot suddenly become two or three people. Uh, be that as it may, uh, notice here that there's a, re a requirement that um, if there's no interpreter in the church, the speaker in tongues is to be uh, quiet and to speak to himself and to God. But there's an underlying assumption that the gift of tongues with interpretation is to be used in church, and it, you're not supposed the pastor's not supposed to say, "No, I'm the pastor; I do all the talking." These gifts are given to edify the body of Christ. The body of Christ, when the body of Christ comes together, we call that church. We call that the assembly, the ecclesia. And the gifts are given to be used. In, there's an underlying assumption that the gifts of the Spirit are given to be used in the uh, church. Okay, so, so far, this passage has really attacked some traditional notions of church, that church is about um, going and listening to a pastor give a 45-minute sermon. That idea is not in the Bible. What we do see in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 14 is that uh, these gifts of the Spirit mentioned in chapter 12 are to be used in the assembly in an edifying way so that all things can be done unto edifying. And that's the assumption. Um, in, in the passage that the passage is based on. Now let's look a little bit more specifically at the use of prophecy in church. <clears throat> now I know there's some theologians who have basically redefined prophecy. Um, my impression from reading uh, Calvin's commentary on 1 Corinthians is that uh, there's some preaching that's just so good and so from God that it's prophecy. I'm not saying God can't pro prophesy through someone while they're preaching. I believe He can. But it's a dangerous... Uh, or it's a very unbiblical approach to the Bible to redefine prophecy to mean something else nowadays and interpret that out of the Bible than what it actually meant in the Bible. I think a, a really good description of what prophecy is is when Peter describes what the prophets in the Old Testament did. Now, the, the, the Hebrew word for prophecy is translated prophecy in the New Testament. Prophesy in the Old Testament is translated prophesy in the New Testament. Prophet in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for prophet, is translated with a Greek word in the New Testament. So it's reasonable to start with the assumption that uh, New Testament prophecy is more or less the same thing as Old Testament prophecy. And I know there may be some nuances that one could debate on that. But uh, let's start with that assumption here. And uh, for, in 1 Peter one twenty one, Peter says that, Holy men of old spoke, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit moved someone to speak, and they spoke, and that was prophesying. Now, we typically in the Old Testament, and uh, we, we see, Thus saith the Lord, or the Lord says, and then a quote from God. And that's what the prophets primarily did. And they also told about their visions and dreams. And, of course, there were true prophets and false prophets in Old Testament times. And Jesus predicted there would be new, false prophets in New Testament times. So... There are um, so that's one a good uh, understanding of what prophecy is. To speak is moved by the spirit of God, and then there's some other things that don't quite fit with that definition, like uh, people prophesying on musical instruments as moved by the spirit of God, and uh, or sign acts where Jeremiah wore an iron yoke um, to demonstrate part of the prophecy. So there's some parts of prophecy. My point is that are not spoken, but can be demonstrated uh, either through acting out something uh, like uh, Ezekiel with his hair. Uh, uh, all the things God told him to do with his hair and uh, the way he laid on, lay on his side. That's part of the delivery of the prophetic message. But primarily it's speaking as moved by the Spirit of God. So 
Let's uh, keep that idea in mind. And uh, the typical example in the Old Testament and um, is, Thus saith the Lord, and a quote from God. And then we, we get the uh, little uh, glimpse of the ministry of the prophet in the New Testament when Agabus goes to Paul and says, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, and gives a quote from the Holy Spirit. So uh, let's keep within a, a biblical understanding of what prophecy means when we talk about prophecy and not just to redefine it to be any any preaching because Paul uh, describes a ministry of uh, lists the ministry of prophet and the ministry of teacher is two separate ministries in 1 Corinthians 12 and also in Romans 12 prophecy and teaching are two different gifts so we we know there's a distinction